So the, the title of my talk this morning is called Roadside Assistance for the Spiritual Journey. And um, I, one of the, the things that I used kind of as background is a book that was written by Rabbi Rami Shapiro called Roadside Assistance for the Spiritual Traveler. And it's this nice little handy book that is just packed with so much amazing information. And um, so I'll draw a lot from this, but I do recommend it uh, if you're interested after we, after we go through this. Um, so I was uh, married here in 1986 to Kevin Owen, who's sitting here. Um, we have two children, ages 29 and 30, who uh, were baptized here and we raised uh, coming to Sunday school and Tuesday school. So we just feel so blessed that, that they had uh, a, a very broad uh, teaching uh, set of circumstances that taught them about all religions and that God is love. And um, so we're very thankful for having the chapel uh, in, our, in our valley. Um, so we came here for our wedding, then we took a little break, and then came back one Christmas Eve, and um, it was packed, because Christmas Eve is always packed here. But there were signs along Meadowwood Drive that said, thou shall not park. And I thought, oh my god, that's too funny. This is the place where we should come. Because, you know, you got to have a sense of humor about some things, right? And so I just felt that connection right away. Um, and I was raised Catholic, and Kevin was raised Methodist, so this, the chapel offered a nice middle ground uh, for us to, to explore our spirituality. Um, over the years, my experiences to learn and grow have been profound, to say the least. Um, along with juggling work and, and raising kids, I was able to attend seminars with spiritual paths, um, religious exemplars, and I'll just read the list because it's amazing. Um, Thomas Keating, Cynthia Bourgeau, Rabbi Rami Shapiro, Ed Bastian, Kamir and Camille Hominsky, Native American spiritual leaders. In addition, we've hosted Richard Rohr, James Finley, Matthew Fox, Michael Brown, Byron Katie, Rabbi Erwin Kula, Rabbi Brad Hirschfeld, the monks from the Deep Rung Losling Monastery, Lexi Potamkin, and it just keeps going on and on. And to, ha to have that kind of experience in such a small town, I just feel like we're all so blessed. And I see a lot of you sitting here who attended as well. And I know you feel the same way that we just had and continue to have these amazing experiences here. Um, this morning, as I said, I'm going to share a lesson taught by Rabbi Rami um, and, and his unpacking of the 23rd Psalm. What I read was meant to be a complement to the actual 23rd Psalm, but what I loved about it when he presented it here is that it just made that prayer become so accessible to me. I, you know, the, well, I'll get into that, but... It, it, it just made a huge difference for me. Um, and what he suggests is that the 23rd Psalm isn't necessarily just a prayer to read at memorials or when people are facing huge struggles. Rather, it, it's a prayer that helps us connect with God or the universe or whatever that is for us um, on a more regular basis. Maybe as the ad about egg says, it's not just for breakfast anymore. And that's kind of how I feel. I feel like this is something that maybe we can tap into, if not daily, just more regularly. To provide a little history, the 23rd Psalm is also known as the Psalm of David. David was a young shepherd boy who would become king. He was a man of God who killed a giant, the giant Goliath with a single stone. He danced before the Lord, praising his name in the Psalms. He was the youngest of eight children, a child of the tribe of Judah, and a direct descendant of Ruth the Moabite. He was a shepherd, a musician, a poet, a giant slayer, a warrior, a rebel, a king, and even a murderer. But above all, he was a lover of God. And the Psalm of David is a hymn of a sinner repenting of his sin and realizing that no matter how far he's fallen, God is there. 
And growing up, when I heard the 23rd Psalm, as I said, it was usually around a funeral or a memorial, or uh, splendor in the grass was coming about when I was young. And I, I didn't quite understand so much about that whole situation, but I knew it wasn't going well for somebody. And so, you know, I just, that's kind of my understanding of it from back then. Um, and again, when he introduced the new, the new rendition, I found that it resonated uh, in a way that the old one had not. And I'll just cite a couple of examples of, of where those, uh, the broader explanation makes sense to me. In the second passage, he says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. And in the compliment, he says, lying in green pastures, I know the one who is all. Walking beside still waters, I humbly follow the watercourse way. And to me, what he's talking about is this connection to earth. It's one thing to walk down a path and just see a horizon. It's kind of a linear situation. But when you actually lay down in the grass and you look up, you see his vastness. And I think he's describing the experience of, of God and the universe. And when you look up, you see sky and clouds and, and uh, just a, a broader view, an expansive view. And the same with, with waters. When you walk by them, they could be still on the surface and be running very hard underneath, and you don't know that. Um, or they could be stagnant and not healthy. Um, but you need to stay connected to nature in order to have a full experience. In the third passage, uh, the original says, he restoreth my soul. The compliment says, my soul is restored. I remember I'm the image of God. And this suggests that we return to our original nature. And our original nature is the image of God. And we so often forget that. We forget you know, to peel away those layers of human humanity that we all are to realize that God is with us. He's there. And we just need to remember that. The fourth passage says, um, the original says, Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The compliment says, When I walk through life's valley shadowed by death, I fear no separation, for you are with me. Your rod warns me of danger. Your staff alerts me to disease. And it's important that there's one thing that happens here. He shifts tense where he's talking about a God that's far away in the first stanzas. He, he um, shifts and starts to talk about you, God, I'm with you. So I'm with you, we're partners. It's, it's accompanied by a sense of acceptance. There is a reconciliation process at work here that finally there's an agreement that we go through this together, whether you're physically there or in my heart. We're going through this together. Whether it's a situation in life or closer to death, the way is through. Um, and there's not much choice here. W walking with God, our fear is gone. The sense of being alone and the notion that we're separate from the whole, apart from God, rather than a part of God, is what Albert Einstein called optical delusion. And what you discover is that there really is no alone. That's our perception, if we choose to keep it. And in the sixth passage, the final, um, the original says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The compliment says, When I walk with you, I leave only goodness and mercy in my wake. When I take ref refuge in you, I know, God, that every place is your place, and every face is your face. Time ceases, death no longer strangles love, and I walk with fierce and freeing faith the pathless land to which you summon me. Now, in this passage, the word dwell implies a time of surrender or a stop in the action. Uh, we stop imposing our will on life situations. Because the only choice we really have is whether or not we're going to walk in fear or in love. And I think the 23rd Psalm is a guide to walking without fear. When you do so, you no longer seek to impose what should be, but learn to work with what is. 
and you do so more gracefully, effortlessly, and without coercion of self or others. Working with life means accepting what is in order to change what's next. And if you want peace, you must first accept the fact that there is conflict. The new version says that when you take refuge in God, your resistance to what is fades. And the bottom line is if you do all these things, you lay down in green pastures, you walk the watercourse way, through the valley of the shadow of death, with courage to reconcile with your enemies, cool your anger, cease your fear, and leave mercy in your wake, you'll discover that you have been and are living in the house of God. Hence, the 23rd Psalm for me is more of a reminder of how to walk the path in love, not in fear, every day starting now. And, and next, I thought I would try to bring this into perspective a little bit, um, kind of where the rubber re- meets the road for me, and tell you about an experience that I had on the Camino de Santiago a couple of years ago. And I think um, that this is where Rabbi Rami's roadside assistance really comes in handy. And I think maybe it's a metaphor for journeying through the valley of life described by David. And a little more history. Um, the Camino is also known as the Way or the Way of St. James. The history of the Camino goes back to 24 AD. It was not long after Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And Christianity began to take hold. And um, Jesus' apostles set out on a mission to share the good word and convert people to Christianity. And they actually divided the area up into territories. And um, St. James got the Iberian Peninsula, which covered Spain, across the Strait of Gibraltar into northern Africa, which is now Morocco. The name Santiago goes back to the Apostle James, Uh, St. James is Santiago, that's the translation. And Romans referred to this area as the fini terra, or the end of the world, because at at the end of one of the trails, um, you come to the point where you're at the water, and at that time, they believed that that was the end of the world. So St. James the Greater was one of the disciples of Jesus and was thought to be the cousin of Jesus himself, as the son of the Virgin Mary's sister and brother, St. Jude Thaddeus. He worked as a fisherman with his brother, John, his father, Zebedee, and his partner, Simon. John and James were followers of John the Baptist and later Jesus. James, along with his brother, John, left life as a fisherman when Jesus called him to be a fisher of men. He followed Jesus as one of his disciples until Jesus was crucified by the Romans. And as earlier stated, he he made the pilgrimage to the Iberian Peninsula to spread the word. And when he returned to Judea, he was beheaded by King Herod Agrippa I in the year 44 AD to please his constituents. He proceeded to arrest Peter also. According to the legend, his body, along with his followers, sailed to the Iberian Peninsula on a rudderless ship with no sail. They were big on um, stories and um, (laughs) miracles. That's what I was going to say. Big on miracles in that group. Landing on the northeast, northwest coast of the Iberian Peninsula, today's Galicia in Spain, they proceeded up the river Ula to the land of Iria Flavia, which is modern-day Patron, or Padron. Patron is the tequila. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) and maybe there was some of that, too. (laughs) So enter another player. The Celtic queen Lupia ruled these lands when they got there, and when asked by James's followers if they could bury his body, she refused and sent troops after them. While chasing the followers of James with his body across the bridge, the bridge collapsed, killing her troops. So she converted to Christianity. She converted. She thought that was a sign. And provided an oxen cart to the followers of James to transport the body. 
Unsure of where they should bury the sacred remains, his followers prayed on this and decided to let the ox choose where they were going to bury him. So he went, the ox went to the top of a hill, and, to, and that's today where the Cathedral of Santiago stands. It's an incredible, incredible place. Um, more and more pilgrims followed the way of Santiago, or the way of St. James, and the original chapel soon became the cathedral of a new settlement, Santiago de Compostela. It became a path of prayer, atonement, and penance. St. James the Greater is universally regarded as the patron saint of pilgrims because he established the Christian religion in the Iberian Peninsula. And there's a, a symbol that you see all across that area. It's a scallop shell, then became recognized as the symbol of all pilgrims on the Camino, as they found those shells on the shore there. When returning to their own countries, pilgrims displayed the scallop shell on their hats or their, or their packs or their backs to show that they were carrying out their pious intentions. And during the Crusades, the shell was a visible sign that pilgrims were there in peace so that they wouldn't get killed on the path. And today, thousands of people venture out on pilgrimage. There are approximately 20 routes that start from all over Europe and end up in the same Um, so I, I learned about it kind of in a weird way, but I read a book by Shirley MacLaine where she, she shared many of stories. She started in France, and that's a 30-day journey. So it's, it's over 500 miles, takes about 30, 30 days, and she did that. And her encounters were fascinating to say the least. They were entertaining, funny. She was hallucinating. I mean, there, it, was, it was great. Um, called The Way, with Martin Sheen and Emilio Estevez. And it's a story of a man and his son who, are, who have an estranged relationship. I won't tell you too much because I think you should really see it. It's really a great movie. Um, but it's a story of reconciliation and letting go. The journey takes place along the Camino, the actual Camino, and the cinematography is brilliant. It looks exactly like it does when you're, when you're actually hiking on the trail. And it, it, so the movie also um, shares the story of other pilgrims who are dealing with their own issues of addictions to alcohol, food, clinging behavior, smoking, whatever else. And um, it's their stories of how they reconcile during their journeys. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. And then a few months later, Kevin and I went to Spain and we happened to be driving across from Bilbao to Santiago and uh, not planning to do anything having to do with the trail. But every now and again, we would see pilgrims crossing the road. And it was, I mean, with big backpacks and sometimes it was raining and sometimes they'd look like they were having fun and sometimes maybe not. But it was just interesting to see that intersection of this primi uh, primitive uh, uh, walk with 21st century roads. I mean, just people driving 50 miles an hour. So I, that was just intriguing also. So we got home, and I thought, you know, I, I just feel like I need to try that or try something about that. So I started to investigate. I found a great guidebook and it explained so many things. I learned about packing. I learned about blister remediation because believe it or not, blisters are what it's about. I mean, if you can control that, life is good. If you don't, it doesn't mean life is bad, but it's certainly gonna be a little less comfortable. And so I learned a lot about that. Um, I learned about people who do it on their own and camp and just hike the whole way, or there are guide companies who will make things very comfortable for you, and, and that's fine. Or you can do something in between, which is what we chose. We thought we would carry our packs and just stay in bed and breakfast. I thought, I can't do both. So, um, so that was the plan. And I asked my daughter, Austin, if she was interested, and she replied with an immediate, yes, I'm going for it. So um, she was great at finding little bed and breakfast along the path, and, and it was great. We charted our path, which was approximately 115 miles, 
uh, beginning in Orsobrero and ending in Santiago. And um, the rule of thumb is that when you pack, your pack should not weigh more than 15% of your body weight. So for me, that was like 21 to 24 pounds. And that was good to know, but it didn't really happen that way. So, <laughs> but off we went. And um, now what I'll do is just tell you a little, I've got four lessons that I learned while we were on our path. And, um, and maybe they'll resonate with uh, some of the journeys that, that you've taken as well. The first one, lesson one, is setting your intention. My intention was to see the face of God in everyone I met. And setting an intention is important because it helps you focus. It's about being in awareness. It's about actively participating and not just going through the motions. It's about becoming an observer. And somehow when I, I did that, I, I could see people differently. For me, I felt like I was cutting through judgments, like preliminary judgments of when you just run into people, um, to actually see them for who they are. And it made me realize that we're all on the same path, but at the same time, we're all on our own journeys. And so that's, it's an important understanding, I think, when you start to relate to people, that we're all on the same path, but we're also all on our own journeys, and we're here to support each other. Lesson two, what you resist persists. So we started the journey, as I told you, thinking we'd carry our packs since we weren't camping and staying at uh, trailside B&Bs. I, of course, overpacked and quickly learned that that was hard work. And the first day started with an uphill, followed by some flats, followed by some pretty steep downhills. And downhills should be easier, but not when you have a lot of weight on your back. And so it was kind of interesting. And um, as the day went on, my pack got heavier. It rubbed my shoulders and waist, and it made my neck ache. And it, I wasn't having too much fun that first day. And after serious consternation, I finally came to the realization I had to quit resisting, or I wouldn't make it to the hotel. So I realized that by focusing on my breath, I could breathe into that discomfort. And I found that I had to detach from that discomfort in order to eliminate my resistance. And so be, by shifting and becoming a witness to that and just breathing into it, I was able to, to shift it. It didn't make it go away completely, but it was tolerable. And I made it to the hotel. And I think, referring back to the 23rd Psalm, I think this suggests that when you take refuge in God or when you take refuge in your inner self, you can accept what is and you can get through it. So when we arrived at our first b and I looked around the lobby and there was a bell stand with luggage tickets and a sign in Spanish about transportation. And I don't speak Spanish, but I kind of knew what it was about. And I looked up to the sky and said, there is a God. <laughs> and quickly made arrangements for our backpacks to be carried to the next hotel the next morning for three euros a day. Three euros, best three euros I've ever spent. Um, lesson three, what's on your playlist? The next couple of days, we noticed that our legs definitely weren't prepared for walking an average of 16 miles a day. And then stories of the inner roommate, as described by Michael Singer in The Untethered Soul, started to crop up, right? Are you familiar with the inner roommate? So Michael Singer says that everybody has an inner roommate who talks to us, even though we may not necessarily know that it's talking to us, and, and they, he tells us all kinds of things, or she tells us all kinds of things. The, your inner roommate is the king of judgment or the queen of judgment, of you, of the people around you, of situations, everything. They've got, uh, they're, they're just there before you consciously know you're there. 
and I caught myself in judgment continuously. I was co concerned about crowds before we left because it turned out that we booked our trip at the busiest time of the year. We were there in uh, September. And I was, you know, going through my mind, oh, there's going to be too many people. They're going to be taking my space. They're going to be crowding the trail. And when we got started, there was this little boy and his mother um, who were taking mountain bikes down the trail because they mountain bikes go along the trail with the hikers. Road bikes take a different route. So there's this little boy and his mother, and the little boy is having nothing of this process. And I thought, oh my God, that poor mother is in for a hundred miles of misery. And then an hour later, that little boy buzzed by me on his bike with a huge smile on his face and yelled, Buen Camino. And I didn't know what that meant, but I thought it must be good because he was very happy. But I also thought to myself, wow, I really misread that little boy. I, I don't know, maybe he just was not quite ready at that time, but he was having a great time. Uh, most people travel the uh, last about 62 miles of the Camino from Saria to Santiago. And they do this because there's a tradition on the Camino that if you uh, hike a minimum of 62, mile, 62 miles or 100 kilometers and get stamps along the way, either at hotels or restaurants or places of business, when you get to Santiago, you get a credential that says you made it. And that becomes really important to people. And yes, it's a little transactional. You know, I mean, they're making money on all the tchotchkes and all that stuff. But it's transactional, but it's also motivational. So I'm good with it. And, and, and I decided I would fall into that too. Uh, and it's funny, I asked my daughter, because you get a little, it's like a little passport. And that's what you get stamped along the way. And I said, Austin, don't you want one? And she said, my feet know how far I've gone. <laughs> She said, I don't need that to tell me how far I've gone. So, um, so because the last 62 miles are pretty popular and, and crowded, it, it just changes the complexion. Earlier on, people are more spread out. But as you get to that last 62 miles, uh, it, it definitely picks up. There are bands playing all day, people celebrating, singing, drinking beer at 8 in the morning. It's just, it, and, and you see that people are there for all different kinds of reasons. Some for sp the spiritual experience, some for having family time. There were little kids doing it. It was amazing. Um, and some just wanting to be there. And then, of course, my grumpy inner roommate starts complaining. You'd be going faster like them if you started in Saria and not three days ago. You know, because it gets a little competitive as you're going through there. But I just shut that down. So I started to notice that inner roommate coming into play more often. I downloaded music, meditations, podcasts, and audiobooks that were helpful passing time on occasion. And I do have to admit that my, I'm from Detroit originally, my Motown music collection got me through a lot of slow times. But what I learned was what you put into your head affects everything, from your pace to your outlook. Booting the inner roommate, listening to positive things, and many times turning it all off so you can focus on your breath and your rhythm and your cadence and your surroundings, it's quite amazing. Lesson four, the divine alchemy. And that's the journey from the head to the heart. From resistance to awareness to acceptance to peace and reconciliation. Over time, you, you start to feel like you're in a meditative process day after day, hour after hour. And what I experienced is that old stuff started to come up in that monotony Old things, stuff I thought I processed, you know, at a seminar at the chapel. Oh, yeah, I let go of that, or I let go of this. Well, no, I didn't, and up it came. But it was really interesting because when those situations that you need to let go of come up and you're in that situation, your body is just working, and it kind of disconnects the physical piece from the emotional piece, and it allows that... 
um, that stuff to come up with any emotion, without any emotion attached to it. And um, it was, that was a profound finding for me. And I do feel like I did let go of some things that I didn't even really know were bothering me. They just kind of came up. And I think back uh, to what Viktor Frankl so famously wrote. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And I think that it might be that the space that he's referring to is that space that's in our heart and the place where that divine alchemy takes place where we're able to let things come up and let them process and then let them go. And so I later learned that Buen Camino translates to good way. And that was the greeting that everybody used on the trail to wish people that you encountered a safe passage. And it also became a quick way so that if you didn't want to start a conversation with somebody, you could just say Buen Camino and be on your way. And I, I think that that's a great custom and I wish that that there was more of that here. And ultimately, to let go is to choose to live. As Joseph Campbell said, I don't believe people are looking for the meaning of life as much as they're looking for the experience of being alive. And so my question for you on this beautiful Sunday is what does the experience of being alive mean to you? Is stepping out of the box scary? What would you do if you weren't afraid today? Like our journeys on an adventure and in the everyday world, the 23rd Psalm and life is, birth, is both a call and a challenge. And it reveals the way of God. It's the watercourse way of seeking the low and humble, the way of blessing and liberation, the way of righteousness, justice, and compassion that leaves only goodness and mercy in its wake. The way is not a fixed path, a paved road, but a pathless land, a way unmapped and uncharted by either the past or by conventions. I think David meant to call each of us out of our narrowness and into our destiny. He meant to humble us and free us to walk the low places with death's shadow to bring light and blessing and freedom to all we meet. I feel very uh, grateful that the spiritual underpinnings of the chapel have, are grounded in Christianity, but draw from the world's wisdom traditions as balance and perspective. It offers everybody the, the possibility to, to draw from a broad array, array of sources and teachings and traditions and incorporate that into their own experience. The chapel also has a welcoming atmosphere that encourages individual spiritual growth, community outreach, and provides a sacred space that enables spiritual development. I think journeys on the Camino are similar to journeys of all of you, people who participate in the chapel community. I'm so grateful for your friendship and your sharing of your journeys because we are all on our own spiritual paths together. And I believe that fostering that growth in each other is the community that'll help us learn to live more skillfully. Buen Camino. <laughs>